Um, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you all very much for coming to um, <coughs> Ivory Tower Defense, which is uh, another one of uh, our nicely punned uh, events. We have no quarter. We have, what are some other puns that we do? Uh, spring fighter. Spring fighter. Uh, <laughs> um, what was the start? Ball craft. Ball craft. Uh, and now uh, Ivory Tower Defense. Um, this is uh, part of our, uh, kind of our guest <coughs> lecture series, but um, tonight it's going to be uh, sort of hosts instead of guests, because these uh, are the, the people that um, have created the uh, NYU Game Center. And um, uh, so tonight we're going to be, um, I'm going to be moderating a panel with uh, Eric Zorman and Jesper Yule, Catherine Isbister. And uh, this is, uh, it has been uh, my honor over the past few years to work with these people to, to create the NYU Game Center, um, along with uh, Charles Pratt and Dylan McKenzie and other, other key members of the team. Um, we have been uh, putting our heads together to figure out how to build something spectacular uh, around games in the university. And um, just recently, we have um, uh, announced uh, our MFA program, the two-year graduate program, uh, MFA in game design, which is happening this fall, and which we are right now in the process of, of uh, recruiting our, our, our first class for, and we're incredibly excited about. And it has been um, it has been a labor of love, I think, for us to to work on uh, creating this this program, and uh, it has been a, a privilege to kind of like think through these really hard problems about what is the best way to frame games as as an academic uh, topic. What is the best way to include games as a field of study? In the university, um, what are what are the, the 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 big challenges around doing that? What are you know the various approaches that you could take? Uh, what are some of the approaches that are already out there that people do? And what is our unique take on it? And um, we've had an incredible uh, you know an incredible amount of fun actually putting this together because we're you know all of us to various degrees are are designers and we've been thinking a lot about this problem as designers collaborating on, on creating a, a, an amazing experience and a machine that works, you know. Um, so we wanted to kind of open up that process um, and uh, use this opportunity to kind of have, a, have that be a broader conversation. We, um, I think there's a lot of this stuff that we are wrestling with, which is on a day-to-day -day basis, that's kind of weird and fascinating and cool, and not all of it we totally agree on. There's a lot of back and forth. And, and so tonight, I think, is a, is a chance to uh, to, to, to share that, that thinking with you guys and to hear back from you um, about, uh, about, about these various issues, about how uh, games are, are included uh, in, in higher education and, and, uh, and, and what are the possibilities there, what are the challenges there, and, and, and what are the best ways to do it. Um, as always, I want to thank our generous sponsors, the people who help make the, uh, the, the Game Center possible in all of our events. Uh, E-Line uh, Media, Smashworks, and Arcadium. So thank you very much to uh, to those uh, awesome forward-thinking. Yes, yay! Thank Our sponsors, advertising, um, and um, money, so money. And yes, money. Um, so why don't we uh, jump right in? What we're going to do is uh, a brief presentations from um, each of these people. And, um, and then we're going to go in, I'm going to ask them some questions, and we're going to have a moderated panel type of thing. And then we'll open it up to, to you guys and, and hear questions uh, from the audience. So what, what, let's start out with um, Eric Zimmerman, who is um, an extremely uh, uh, well-known, high-profile uh, game scholar and game designer, um, and, uh, and someone that I've worked with for, for many, many years. And, um, uh, and, and, and something of a gadfly and, and a, a well-known uh, figure both in the New York uh, uh, game scene and, and just the game industry at large, so, uh, and, and also a teacher for, for many, many years. So, so um, why, don't we, why don't you start us off with your kind of uh, overview? Yeah. So Frank, Frank really just asked us each to speak for a few minutes to introduce some of the work that we do and some of our thoughts on this extremely broad topic of this evening, um, games in the academy. So I think what I, here's my prediction, 
each of the successive presentations will get more, probably more and more better prepared and focused. Although I don't know, maybe those second two will tie for that. So certainly mine will be the least, uh, the least thought through. But I wanted to talk a little bit about game design and research, um, and as a way of, as a way of thinking about what I do. And actually, this was a new way of, of thinking about how I might present a portfolio of my activities. Um, I think that uh, it's not actually clear to me exactly what the relation between game design and research is. Um, the relation between game design as a design discipline and other kinds of disciplines, um, and maybe that's something that we can talk about tonight. Um, I wanted to start by using a, a, a typology that comes from Peter Hall, who's a design writer about design from uh, the book Design Research that Brenda Laurel edited. And he has three categories for thinking about the relationship between design and research. There's research about design. In other words, maybe research about the history of design, thinking about it in terms of the, the humanity study or the, the objects that design makes. There's research, thank you, Catherine, excellent, for design. In other words, maybe um, research that, uh, that creates tools for designers can use, so that it's really research that is there to assist the design process or designers. And then lastly, research through design, research through making. So the, other, I, the idea is that we can do research just by being creative designers, by, by being experimental and innovative in that way. So tonight when I was thinking about what I do, I think that, I think if you think about the three of us, probably we have, you know, you could do sort of do like a, an RPG stats kind of thing where, you know, we're, we're each have different weights in these three areas. Yes. But, but I, I did manage to find some, some of my work that's in, in each of these. So do you mm -hmm. want to go ahead? And, yeah. So research about design, well, I think that, uh, as Frank said, really a lot of the work that we do here is, is collaborative. And the Games 101 course is something where it's a class about design. And just, just to sort of tell you guys about one of the really fun courses that we've had, we've had a good time designing. Anyone taken Games 101? Uh, a cool. few people, OK. Yeah. So Games 101 was our attempt to say, what's missing in our curriculum? Students come in to take a game design class or game theory course. But you know the problem is that some of these people are, are role playing game addicts, but they don't spend any time on Facebook, or they're, they really know a lot about German strategy board games, but they've never actually played a first-person shooter. Well, Games 101 is our attempt to inculcate games literacy. It is a, it's a lecture course that, that uh, fills up a room of 50 students every semester, and different faculty give lectures, and we really treat the history of games like the history of art. Um, so that, for me, that is, and I give, a, I give a couple of those lectures, and so do the people here on stage and a couple people in the audience, too. That, that for me was research about design, really doing research about the history. Um, and in that sense, really uh, teaching becomes a form of research. Another project that the cards over there are from a project I did, uh, which is sort of ongoing with a couple collaborators, Colleen Macklin and John Sharp, called the Metagame. That is a collectible card game that initially was a massively multiplayer game at the Game Developers Conference. And now is you can buy the home version online if you go to metagame.com. Uh, and it's, um, uh, it's, it's, um, the game is, uh, it basically turns, it's a little bit of a discussion-oriented game, or a little bit like apples to apples. And it's a game that, as you can see, has game cards. So there's a Battle Zone card and a King's Quest card. And then it has all these other cards that are really comparisons between them. And so the game is about, the game is about talking about design. And in that sense, maybe I'm stretching it a little bit, but for me, this game also turns players into kind of philosophers, aesthetic philosophers of games. And, and so both of these a little bit were research about design. What games do we include in the canon? How do we, how do we curate them? So the metagame really was a sort of curatorial project as much as a game design project. The next slide has a couple uh, examples of my research for design. So while rules of play is also about design, because we do go a little bit into the history of certain games, it's more uh, uh, providing conceptual tools for design. So uh, rules of play is a textbook that I co-authored with Katie Salen. That's really a standard textbook on game design these days, and it's it for me it's a it's a project that um, uh, uh, is provides concepts that help designers understand what games are, how they function, and how you can design them and redesign them to create meaningful experiences for players. My teaching and that uh, next shot is uh, of a uh, of a game in progress from last week I think from uh, advanced game design and, and the idea of teaching students by making that to me is also research uh, for design. In other words. I am, uh, my, my teaching is providing students with, with ideas and methodologies to help them understand what design is, and, and it helps me understand it too. Um, practice is an event that we put together here at, at New York City. That was, uh, at, at NYU, that was a conference that brought together 
uh, game designers from across the spectrum, board game designers, card game designers, computer and video game designers, as well as people like the NCAA uh, Football Rules Committee Chair. So designers from sports, um, and to, to talk about game design in, in detail. And the name practice comes from the idea that the question is, what is the day-to-day -day practice of game design, right? It was not a conference about getting into the industry or the, the, the process of making a game or the technology behind games, but really about game design itself. Um, lastly, I do a lot, Frank mentioned that I'm sort of a gadfly, so I do a lot of things throughout the industry to think about, you know, what, what are interesting sort of interventions that I might do. Um, this screenshot of the Emily Dickinson uh, USB is a, is a slide that Will Wright made in response to a panel I put together at the Game Developers Conference every year um, called the Game Design Challenge, and I present the game designers with a strange and weird and unique uh, uh, challenge for uh, that they have to solve by creating a game. So in a sense, um, uh, that's a kind of research too, helping people think about new ideas in games. And in this case, it was uh, create a game based on a license because in the commercial video game world, there's always a or there there has been controversies about doing licensed as opposed to original games. And in this case, um, the license was the poetry of Emily Dickinson. So it was a it was really trying to think about games in a new way as 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 they as they might embody or relate to poetry. Um, finally, uh, research through design. So this is just a very random sampling of the probably hundreds of games that I've made over, over the years on and off the computer. Um, I've made games like Sissy Fight uh, on the upper left, a game about little girls uh, in a schoolyard in social conflict. Uh, do lots of, uh, done some paper games like um, Figment, this game that was designed to be taken out of a book. Um, game Star Mechanic on the, on the lower left is a game I made uh, with my company Game Lab. Um, that was a local game development studio I ran for about 10 years. And that was a game that about creating games. So it's a, it's a game designed for kids at the whole website that still exists where, where kids can, can, uh, can, can put together games. Um, and, uh, and then the, um, uh, in the middle is a Connect game I recently made uh, about meditation. And then I've been also been doing a bunch of games with uh, our architect, Natalie Putzi, and this is a, our first project together. We do large scale physical games. So, you know, I like to think about the games that I make as a form of research too. So just like I talked about teaching and writing textbooks um, and uh, designing a curriculum here, I think about design as an exploration. And in a sense, um, I like to think about the games that are produced as a sort of residue of an ongoing investigation into a number of issues that I'm interested in. So I'm, you know, I'm very engaged with the process of making games. I like making a great, well-crafted game. It's not that I abhor you know, sort of tight, elegant products, but um, really uh, they're a form of investigation through the world. And that kind of leads me to my last slide, which is this idea that um, I, you know, I'm becoming more and more interested in game, des game design or design in general, not as the creation of products, but as a practice. In other words, as a practice that might be a meditative practice or a spiritual practice, but in any case, a meaningful practice, a practice that helps us engage with the world in a more meaningful way. I could give many examples. I'll give one example of how game design, it, it creates this kind of meaning. If you're creating a, a game as a designer, you ultimately have to think about the person for whom you're designing or the type of people for whom you're designing. So in a sense, being a designer means being, it, it is a humanistic uh, endeavor, that you have to be able to try and see the world through, through someone else's experience. And um, while it's true that not all designers have that as a methodology. For me, it's a very important part of the methodology is to think about, um, think about what it means to design for someone else, to be able to try and embody the, the psychology or emotions or, or ideas or preconceptions of, of your player or, or players. So, so that, that's just one way in which I think, for me, game design becomes a very meaningful and meditative practice. And I think that you know, what I love about game design as a whole is that it, that it embodies all of these different things, that it, on the one hand, is mathematics and logic, but it's also aesthetics and storytelling. It's also psychology, emotion, and social interaction. It's also thinking about culture like an anthropologist. Um, and the, the practice of game design is really the engagement with the, the creation of games as a, as a form of, of research and experimentation uh, across all of those levels. So it's, um, uh, that, I guess I'll, I'll leave it there for now. But those are my opening comments. Thank you. Awesome. Those are great. Um, so next, why don't we um, throw it over to Catherine. Uh, Catherine Isbister is, uh, is a teacher and, and uh, researcher at the NYU Poly, 
and um, someone that uh, we reached out to as we were uh, developing the Game Center and wanted to make sure that we were uh, doing, uh, NYU is a very big school, and the Game Center is, is kind of one piece of this larger puzzle, which there's a lot of stuff going on about games uh, at NYU. So there's the Games for Learning Institute, um, there's there's uh, the uh, the games uh, research uh, game innovation lab. game innovation lab mm -hmm. at, at NYU Poly. Mm -hmm. um, there you know there's there's all kinds of things. So we um, in in an effort to kind of like make sure that we were coordinating our efforts to to create the, the kind of um, uh, uh, coherent overall picture. We kind of reached, and then we started to just like pull her in. We got more and more. <laughs> so now we sort of like we we own a, a, a chunk of her time. So she, yes. she, we we now share Catherine's appointment uh, uh, with uh, NYU Poly, and I think it, it, hopefully we'll get we'll get more and more of it. Um, <laughs> Catherine is uh, is uh, has been doing um, uh, design and and research and, and teaching and writing in games for for a long time, um, with a strong focus on. Uh, uh, doing research into into uh, the interaction, the usability, and also uh, characters and emotion. I think that's a big mm -hmm. part of the the work you do. And you've written books about uh, characters in games right. and uh, and and better uh, uh, interfaces for games. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but but please give us give us your overview of yeah. Of, uh, let me so let me. Uh, so I took this in a slightly different direction, but I'm, I can't stop thinking about the stats. I'm like, hmm. That's going to look like on the <laughs> This is a kind of weird diagram that this Swedish guy named Daniel Fellman created, which I find really helpful in explaining why I'm working on games to my colleagues in computer science, which is that uh, wearing my hat as somebody who's primarily in human computer interaction, I'm using games as a way to understand how to innovate interaction with technology because I think games are often leading the way in terms of creating a really fluid, engaging, expressive experience for people. And I'm very interested in, in making that happen even more broadly outside the realm of games. So although I have worked on games as such to produce interesting final artifacts, most of the time when I'm building games in my lab, it's actually to answer a particular research question. Um, Wait, can you explain the diagram? Are yeah, the dotted sure. lines where the boxes go that the person is so, creating? So, so the research <coughs> side is, is you're making things um, and you're, you're iterating on your design, but in the end you're trying to produce knowledge that other people can use towards doing things. Whereas on the design side, you're, it, it's like you were saying about your actual practice of designing games. Right. So you're, you're creating iterations and you're doing research Along, along the way, but in the end, what you're trying to do is actually craft something, craft an artifact, right? So, is there a relationship sense? between the small squares? I, and I'm the... going to have to All right. send you to Daniel Feldman. Right. He's not here today, but uh, anyway. So, so I'm actually trained as a social scientist. Um, I was kind of both a science and an English kid my whole life, and. Um, uh, one of the things that I've always brought to my work on games is kind of turning away from the screen to look at the players on the other side. So when we do research in my lab, we hook up all these cameras and we look at what's happening among people as they play, and that's something I'm very interested in. And when we do craft games, um, we tend to craft them to answer particular questions. So this was a game we made called Wriggle, which was basically a controlled experiment about the impact of rigorous movement on people's emotional states. So we made a game you either wore the silly hats or you used keyboard controls, and we looked at what happened for people. So in the process, we had to create a reasonably engaging game, but that wasn't really what it was about. Uh, another example that we're working on now, we're doing testing with middle school kids. Scoop is a game that uses this research on taking power poses, like taking up a lot of physical space. There's research that shows that changes your biochemistry and actually makes you less stressed. So we're trying to see if that could reduce math anxiety. So we're creating these rehearsal games for learning fractions where we force the kid into high power poses to actually execute on the game to see if we can impact how they feel. So that's the kind of stuff we do in my lab. Um, and as Frank was saying, you know, I've always been very industry focused in my research. I'm really interested in asking questions that are relevant to practice because in the end the reason why I get up in the morning is because I really want to shape how people actually deal with technology. I want it to be fun, engaging, aesthetically pleasing, enjoyable and not kind of horrible and mechanical and, 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 and disastrous, right? So, so these books are both um, from Morgan Kaufman, which kind of spans between the game industry and the academic world. And I've been lucky enough to be able to kind of ride that line for most of my career, which is great. Um, 
So in thinking about, you know, how people in academia should relate to the world of practice, like the first thing is I do consider it my duty to be a mad scientist. Like if I was actually building commercial stuff, I would be in the commercial world. And so I feel like if I'm not doing wacky, crazy experiments and encouraging my students to do that, then I'm not really doing my job. But on the other hand, I, I've met a lot of academics who spend time only in the lab and cook up stupid problems that no one cares about the answer to. So I also see myself as somebody who has to be a bridge builder. And I go to GDC every year. I give talks there as well as in my sort of hardcore academic conferences. And I really see that as a vital role that I can play. And that's part of why, quite honestly, I got dragged into this crew because it was so much fun working with them on this curriculum. And they're such great team players, which is much more from the commercial world because most of them are hybrid people too, that it's just, it's a joy to work with them. Um, and then also, I feel like most of what we do is we transmit you know, our perspective to students and send them off into the world. And so I think that's a huge part of, of what we get to do, and it's a lot of the fun of it. So that's it. Nice. nice. Yeah. Um, we're, not, we're, not, we're not really applauding, but it's like a, a weird, <laughs> awkward, single applause. Um, I thought you were going to do the thing how other people see. I thought you were going to go there with the uh, with the pictures, right? Oh, you know, yeah. That was oh, how, no, that means... How I no, see no, no, how no, other people see Which one? Um, like, what? So, of course, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to switch over and, and uh, get a get a quick overview uh, from from Jesper Yule. Yeah, I didn't uh, get the white slide memo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Jesper is, um, uh, despite his, his, uh, his youthful appearance, is really one of the pioneers <laughs> of game studies. Uh, someone who um, was really kind of uh, laying laying the foundation for for games as the, for, for the study of games as a scholarly field, and um, author of many books and and uh, um, and another one of the, the core faculty of the, of the game center. So uh, take it away, yes, sir. Uh, all right, thanks. Uh, no, it was it was very interesting to to sort of prepare this sort of brief statement because it got me thinking about things. So, so in a way, like, I realized that, that the three books I've written are, in a way, like, all responses to, to sort of, well, you can say, like, failures or, or problems or, or, or itches. Uh, so the two first uh, are, are, in a way, the first one, my first book, Half Wheel, was, was in a way, like, a response to, to a, a sort of CD-ROM project, project I worked on back in the late 90s, which was like a storytelling CD-ROM, and I, I hated the project, and, and this sort of created this kind of <laughs> scar in my, in my soul that I, <laughs> I, I could only repair by, by doing research and, and, wow, and writing, writing the, a... The hidden history of the a, a, a and ludology. And, 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 and in, in a way, the, 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 the second thing, like the, the, the kind of book, the, my second book about casual games was, was sort of response to two things. I was working on a casual game project, and it, it was sort of more difficult to, to sort of make that game than I, I'd sort of, uh, I had supposed. And and, uh, and also at the same time, I was got, got sort of drawn into playing casual games myself in, in this kind of somewhat reluctant way. Uh, and, and that's it also, so I sort of tried to, to heal that the way with writing that second book. And, and the, third, the third book is really just more, more, more about, it's not actually about design, it's just about like failing as, as a player. So, so, so you can say it's all about different kinds of uh, sort of like problems or, or things that make you make you feel bad. And is which, that really the cover, or is that just a placeholder? Uh, that's a placeholder. Oh. And the cover of the app is going to be backwards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But but it's going to be thinking about like to, yeah. So so I also worked as a as a game developer and as a both as a designer as a programmer, and, and it it got me thinking about like the different difference in the two kinds of processes. And and as my two sort of co-presenters have already discussed. So they're kind of similar, right? In, in that they, you know, you identify a problem, you sort of propose a kind of solution, you, you, you sort of t test against the world, like you see, does this really work, like the way you, you wanted it to do? Like, uh, as a as a game developer, you might play test. As a researcher, you might sort of like try to sort of pull the people over in the elevator. Don't you think this is a great yeah. idea? And then to just to sort like of a scathing blog post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of kind of the kind of play testing of, of research, right? And then you publish at the end. So, so they're very, very similar, iterative in, in, in that, in that, in that sense. Uh, they're also very different. What they're very different in is, is in terms of scope and time frame, right? So, so uh, I also been doing stuff a little along the lines of, of Catherine, where where I was doing like two versions of a game. So, like one, for example, one one game, one version which is sort of very nice to the player, and one which is sort of very rude to the player to see how players sort of perform in reaction to that. Uh, 
and then you can you get out you get some numbers and you can you can talk about that but but in a way the the, the problem or the issue with the thing with game development is that, that what you're usually focusing on is solving this particular problem in this particular game. Like, why doesn't the player see the fact that there is a small, uh, that, that the sword is behind the training grounds, for example, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, but but ga game research ten tends to be much more generalized. So you, you want to generalize across, the, like, for, for all games, it is the case that if you address the player thus, they will react in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that um, that, that creates some issues, right? So, so it's typically that, 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 that often the case that if you, you make a game, then having solved like one particular problem is, is rarely sort of generalizable enough to, to publish it, and vice versa. The game research is often so generalized that, that, that a game, game developer will complain it's not really applicable to whatever problem they're trying to solve it at a particular time. Uh, yeah, so, so in a way, that, that, that is the problem, right? That, that's what, what makes, it, makes it sort of hard to do all these kind of things at the same time, even though they're so similar. Uh, but I, I should say that, that sometimes... What formula is that? Really? <laughs> so can, can, somebody, can somebody see what the formula is? <laughs> uh, uh, quantum uh -huh. cro chromodynamics? Uh -huh. I, I was reading up on particle <laughs> physics, I thought it was sort of interesting. Uh, so so be because that, that's always like, that's about like somebody trying to create this kind of perfect formula that describes how the universe appeared and so on. But, uh, but I think sometimes, uh, sometimes research has been called on, I think, to give guidelines on how to great, make great games. And, and sometimes I, I even sort of share that that sort of that, that sort of hope I, I, I like, I, in a way that I'd love to to sort of give this kind of formula I, I hope it's, it's probably I, I would hope it would be shorter than this but I, I assume it would actually be a lot longer that that's a problem and you see the reason that, and that's a that's a that's a reason why it's a problem right because um, the truth is that games are cultural products right and 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 people are just these kind of very weird creatures that get tired of things. So so this is so you can say that that like like John Travolta's suit in in in, in Saturday Night Fever is the perfect solution to that question. Like so, how should what should John Travolta's suit in Saturday Night Fever look like, right? But it's not a it's not an answer to this question. Like how should all clothing what should all clothing be like? Or it's not even an answer to like what what clothes should you be wearing at a nightclub at all times. So, so that's that. That I think. So that's the problem, right? And that shows like the difference in, in kind of scope and time frame. So, but that's also I think it's also in a way like shows you what research should be doing, right? It should be, it should actually be the, the bigger picture. It shouldn't just be like how high is should like what color should the should the should the doorknob be, right? But it should be more about like how does one determine what colors doorknobs should be, right? <laughs> With, mm -hmm. with the acknowledge that may, that it may change over time depending on this and that, so so uh, I think it does does sort of I think that does sort of explain explain that that and it's also like it's important it's, it, it's important that we don't don't come out and, and claim that we've sort of solved that problem like for for eternity, but yeah so you know the sort of famous Tolstoy quote like all happy families are the same all unhappy families are, are different, and I, I realized that. That in a way, the most sort of successful development project I've done is, is something I've never written about, which is a, like a virtual world that's actually sort of been running since 1997. Hmm. Uh, I never felt like ri writing about virtual worlds. It's just like uh, we just made the thing, and it was sort of very successful. Well, in, in, by 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 Dan in, in Denmark, right? But uh, but the the thing I wanted to write about is is is, is always the kind of things that don't quite work as well as, as I was I was as I was hoping. So, so theory, I think, and and so so, and I think that's that's the thing, right? In a way, it's it's always sort of easier or more sort of motivating to write theory or to research about the things that don't work, like where you don't like you don't understand why why this is not coming together, or 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 typically, like, as I like to do, also like you you have to say like you often have like two different ways of thinking about something, uh, and then you can't you can't figure out why they give different results, and so, and then then it's like that that's this kind of itch that you you sort of want to scratch. Uh, and I think then, then uh, perhaps like the, the that's you can say that the the hope in a sense uh, of something like the MFA here is, is that the the lion shall shall lie with <laughs> with the lamb, right? That that uh, which one's the lion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah this is also in my note. I'm not sure which, which is which. It just depends on the context. But yeah, no, the lamb is is the development. Right? Uh, 
I yeah. think you're a lion in lamb's clothing. Like we could yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, but, but I think that that that, uh, but, I mean, so, so just that that, I, I think that's a lot that brings design and research together. Uh, but, but that I think that in a way, like the, the hope here is that we 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 have a starting point that does that isn't based on like so sort of one came only wanting to build things and one came only wanting to sort of write research papers that but that we like we share both a kind of method and a, a kind of a interest in, in doing things that are both on the kind of very sort of, sort of specific level of solving this problem and 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 of on the kind of very big general in the large scale picture of like thinking about games that through all times mm -hmm. and that's that's the dream awesome um, so uh, let's launch into into a into a uh, discussion here um, and I want to start by just pointing out that I mean we're having this talk at a time when I think there's a larger question about the role of the university in general, right? I, I think that there's there's a there's a broader debate happening in culture about higher education and the academy and the university and what what is it for? Um, and so there are you know is is it is it about is it a kind of like accreditation process where you go for four years and you prove that you that you got in and that you passed and that that that, that badge then allows you to go and, and build a career and, it, and you you're demonstrating signaling that you that you went to Harvard or, or wherever you went um, is is it about the the uh, the protection and the cultivation of a certain kind of intellectual culture that doesn't exist in a broader sense and so we need to create a place that preserves that and is it about teaching and transmitting ideas from one generation to the next is it is that the fundamental or 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 you know is it is it about the search for truth is it about like a place an institution where we solve some of these really big hairy problems that are facing the world and so there there are really interesting questions about that and i just want to hear from you guys do you do you have a, a larger theory of the, of the university do you have a, have you do you think about this issue about about what that is for and does that feed in then to your to, to what we do here on the on the in the trenches of, of uh, teaching about games. Well, I I I mean, I remember when I was in high school, uh, in the eighties, the debates were going on about the role that this. It, just we were talking about, and the the debate was about should our universities becoming too vocational? Are they places where students go to have an experience of of learning about the life of the mind? Um, should universities have um, job job uh, uh, training. Uh, training type programs or should they have internships work work internship programs and I and I remember when this was actually a debate and I just feel that in the decades since then uh, that the, the 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 vocational idea of education has has grossly won the debate in American culture that that people want to measure high school students by having or and junior high school students by having them score on, on standardized tests and um, that uh, that that the the question is, is college worth it in terms of the money you put in versus the, the, the salary increase or the job that you get out? I'm, obviously, that's not universal, but I think in the, in the culture, that, you, that the, the, the kind of more idealistic version of that sort of life of the mind and intellectual community of scholars, which being the, a child of academics, I think I sort of hold on to that romantic idea a little bit um, myself. Um, I think that that lost. But where does that put us? I'm not sure. You know, another interesting thing was that I, I was trained as a painter and I got this extremely modernist, formalist training in my discipline. So I was taught by students of Joseph Albers, who wrote Interaction of Color, um, which was the super visual, visuals only idea of what fine art was. So the, you know, fine art was line color composition. And the, our, my professors used to say things like, there are no ideas in art, meaning there's no, the art is not about politics, it's not about storytelling, it's not even about emotions and psychology. It's really about the pure interaction of visual elements. So I got this sort of super amazing vi visual training as a painter in college, but at a certain point, at this was in the, the postmodern uh, turn of the 90s, and I, I was like, how does this possibly explain, you know, Barbara Kruger and Jeff Koons and, and performance art and all of these other things that were good, Laurie Anderson and all of the sort of great art figures of that time. And um, um, so, so when I came into games, you, so I sort of learned this discipline, and then I sort of had to sort of uh, detach myself from it in order to enter contemporary culture, and then um, uh, uh, at the same time, um, you know, I sort of learned what knowledge was. Like having to learn a craft, which in this case 
was, you know, not the craft of, say, of science or writing or, or humanistic research, but it was the craft of painting. It, it actually taught me what a body of knowledge is, right? It's, it actually is something that has techniques, but it also has ideologies attached to it. It has a certain relationship to history, a certain relationship to contemporary culture. So then um, going into games, when I sort of switched careers and, and uh, went into games, I thought, oh, well, now I'm in this new discipline, and there's this whole history of, of criticism and, and debates about history of games and, and theory and practice, and it just didn't exist. I mean, there were little threads of it here and there. Frank and I started teaching here at NYU almost 20 years ago, and we were like scrabbling around looking for books for our syllabus, and it was this very strange patchwork of, of philosophy from the mid-century and strange like commercial books on the history of video games as this kitty, mm -hmm. kitty, uh, you know, electronics form yeah. and stuff like that. So, yeah, so I remember, um, I, yeah, I remember like pulling Quizinga off the shelf and being literally like, oh, this looks, oh, Homo right. Ludens, this is like silly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, so we were, we were, so, but, but, so, so my point is about where we are, um, is that. I still feel that in a very conservative way, I'm kind of still looking for that craft of game design that I had mm -hmm. as a painter. And that Rules of Play, the textbook that I co-authored with Katie Salen, is, was very much an attempt to say, okay, well, let's create that, or an approach to, not the approach, but an approach to that language of bridging theory and practice and, and th thinking about methodologies and, and things like that. So I kind of see the Game Center and the Game Center MFA as being, for me, it's part of that idea of, of trying to create this idea of craft, something that's well crafted. But of course, as a designer, like I said, being a designer means thinking not in terms of a one one mode or method or or practice. You have to be sort of a mathematician and an economist, sort of a storyteller and a and a visual designer, sort of a cultural anthropologist and and demographer, um, sort of an entrepreneur, and but also a charlatan. You know, all all of these things all at the same time. So so it's a it's a craft and also in a funny way, sort of a non craft too. But I'll kind um, of put it there. All right. What, what about uh, what about you guys? Any thoughts about the big well, picture of what I would like to add to that? Is? That I think that for me, one of the most important things about my own education was community, like being immersed. And I went to two very different schools. I went to the University of Chicago undergraduate, which is like the ultimate, like wear black, smoke cigarettes, talk about Heidegger place. Then I went to grad school at Stanford, which was this like sun soaked athletic campus like I'll never forget the day that the Stanford swim team paraded by chanting Stanford swim team and I was like what planet am I on is this a school like it was just so weird but but like Silicon Valley permeated that place and so when I think about school I think the vocational thing is so weird because I think for me it was about learning from the people struggling right beside me how to do the craft but also how to step back and talk about it like I kept having this metaphor in my mind when you were talking of like teaching, it's so cheesy, but teaching someone how to fish, like really the nuances of like tying flies, but also you have to make your own decisions about where you're going to fish and how quiet you as a person can actually be and wh where you actually like to hang out and which gear you prefer and so forth. But you sort of flesh that out for yourself through a lot of conversation, not just with your profs, but also with others who are like-minded. And after a while, you, you know that if you're that kind of a person, you're going to go to that place. So... Yeah, so, 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 so there's this experience that I always have when I discuss with, with students what, what a game is, and then I ask students to like make, try to define a game, and then in like two thirds of the cases, they, they end up with definitions that, that where, where you can, it's very clear that the university fits the definition, right? because it's something like that has hmm. got a rule system and, and something that's sort of good or bad or like an evaluation of what, what you're doing. Hmm. And in, in a way, I think that 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 the I think I got into what I'm doing in, in a sort of weird way. Like I know a friend of mine was doing a PhD on, on James Joyce Ulysses, and and I was like very sort of clear that 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 I didn't really want to do that because it, it was in a way such a sort of well-defined path. Also in the sense that that there was well-defined that was like 200 previous commentaries that, that you had to comment on, and, and I wanted something that was sort of a bit more <laughs> free, I guess. Uh, and then, in in a way, so 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 the the thing that sort of like that that sort of that I'm always thinking about is that 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 I wonder. So the danger of what we're doing, in a way, is that we we end up making video games boring. Right? So th that, that's the problem. <laughs> but then you say you say that 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 for that for, for for Ulysses, it's not a that big a problem. Most people think it's really boring. Right? But 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 for games, it's a, it, it's a potential problem that we end up like. 
like writing, just making this kind of long list of like the reading list that you have to you have to go through, and these kind of ways you have to analyze games and so on. That in a way we we end up making it into this kind of very sort of boring, finally, boring, oh, very, very boring <laughs> game. Like that's just like that, that that you just sort of have to that you can sort of do with a walkthrough, but just doesn't really give you a lot of time to to uh, a lot, lot of sort of wiggle room of your own. So in a way you can say uh, what I want to worry about is that, that I'm sort of that 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 if we if we do this the wrong way, we will sort of end up, I don't know, like pulling up the ladder by which we, we came, if you, mm. if you follow that metaphor. Mm -hmm. So so I think that that's the thing. I think it's sort of it's very, it, it's 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 really important to, to, to to sort of keep building like disciplinary identity, and, but also like make, making sure that there is the, like whatever percentage is like it, there's this kind of space for someone to come and tell us that 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 we that we are wrong and that, that we don't. Don't have all the answers, mm -hmm. uh, in a way. So, so, so that's. I think that's the. the yeah. yeah. So I, that's where I'm, <clears throat> I'm thinking about. It. I think my position actually is. I mean, is you know, even though I sort of talked about the craft, I actually think I, I have a lot of sympathy with what Catherine said. That if you look, that the idea that more than putting classes together or curriculum or you know developing a vocabulary, it's more about putting people together in the right context, mm. and that is a design problem, mm -hmm. yeah. specifically a design problem. So you know, like I said, that that. But in the right context for what? Well, for, to what end? What is the purpose? To make amazing. You know stuff. what I mean? Like. But 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 I yeah, so, uh, so, uh, but <laughs> to make amazing uh, stuff. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Whether it's ideas or whether it's. But why don't you just start a company then? I mean, if you or or start a collective, an arts collective, or a game, you know, a game studio, or. Like, what, what is it about the university that, it, it, you know, why like, here instead of instead of outside of the, the walls of the it's university? It's like a beautiful, it's like, yes, we're saying it is a weird, beautiful structure of, that for bounded concentration like a game mm. towards some end. Right. And then you can kind of create this amazing culture that can expand and contract within that right. framework. And people move through it and then they go and start, like... I worked in research labs and I worked in startups and I worked in design consultancies and part of why I came back into the university is because I love that flow. It's like being in an active river instead mm -hmm. of being in this kind of strange backwater or in some like totally crazy rapids that I can't ever breathe in. So I think there's something really unique about the atmosphere and environment yeah. of the university. <clears throat> it's true. I, I, I do think that if the game metaphors act, that, that part of what makes games meaningful is the artificiality of that in a classical sense, I don't want to get into the magic circle debates, but in a classical sense, there's a there's a board, there's a boundary between a game and the real world. Even though it depends how you frame it, it could be permeable or not even there. But but the art the artificiality of the game is what is what turns this little figurine into the king that belongs to me and not you for the duration of the game. That um, that that I guard jealously and, and try so hard, but, but still can only move it when it's my turn in certain ways. Um, and in a sense, the, the artificiality of the, of the university is something that also creates meaning. I studied karate as a form of Zen meditation for more than 10 years, and the artificiality of the dojo is incredibly important. It's not real life. It's this weird ritualized place where, you know, there's strange hierarchies of authority and um, maybe too much, which is why I don't study it anymore in that particular place. But, but, but the artificiality of the university is also really important, and it's what potentially imbues... The, the community of like-minded collaborators and comrades and, and experimenters and researchers to, to give them a sort of a respite maybe from the commercial uh, demands of running their own studios right. um, or the, the you know, uh, of being in, in the life outside the university and, and mm -hmm. creates that little special garden where unexpected things can bloom. So yeah. I don't know if it's creating amazing things as a measure for success. Maybe it's about an impact on the industry, but what, mm -hmm. what impact that would be I'm I'm not sure. I mean, video but, games are set to be the, the the defining cultural form of the next hundred years, and it, we're still really just at the beginning of their the infancy of their development. So there's there's so much experimentation to be done. It does seem like um, just from the, the way we think about it and, and what we put together that we that for, I, th I think there are many different approaches, right? And you could look at some place like like DigiPen or Full Sail, which has I think a much more like they're an on-ramp into the game industry, right? And it is more of a kind of a vocational approach. And I think for many people that might make sense that I think our identity as an institution, thinking about what who NYU is and, and what the game center is within M NYU is very much, is very different from that. It's, it's about uh, thinking of uh, a, a complementary space that does 
what what you can't do out in in the industry um, that is that is uh, cr you know creating a space for uh, experimentation and innovation and for asking the hard questions and and uh, I mean the industry is incredibly creative and 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 innovative in its own way but there are some questions which don't get asked in the marketplace because of the particular incentives and pressures of the marketplace and um, and there and, and the university can can be a space in which those questions are getting asked and answered yeah. and people are kind of discovering things that they might not have a chance to discover um, you know in, in the mainstream and also just speaking as someone who's grounded heavily in a tech department mm -hmm. uh, you know the game industry, at least in the U.S., has traditionally been heavily mired in the tech field, which is incredibly ahistorical. So it speaks to what Eric was saying about, well, in painting, you know, there's this huge tradition of criticism and writing and thinking and a kind of respect for the huge history that's happened. And I feel like that's another really important thing to take on that's been really exciting for me to work right. on this program. Yeah. Because... People are rushing to innovate, and they're not framing that in the context yeah. of, you know, and somebody who's at full sale, they know how to be an excellent level of designer, but they don't know where that came from. Like, why are there levels at all? And, you know, what's that going to evolve into as the form changes, right? Yeah, that's a, so, that's a great, I mean, I think that's, the, that's a great topic in and of itself, because as, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that we've done at the Game Center is to say our approach to games is very much as a creative form. Mm -hmm. uh, that we're taking a, an extremely, uh, you know, like strong stance and saying games uh, as as a uh, as a cultural uh, expression, as a creative form, uh, very much within the humanities. Uh, thinking about, um, really? you know, yeah. Do 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 you not agree? I I mean, it's an MFA in game design. It's not an MA in game textual studies, right? I'm not. I mean, humanities is. Literature, art history, games, game fiction studies. Yeah, I'm saying yeah. Ga yeah. games as as a like literature or art, not 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 like oh, not, oh, not like literary criticism Consider or art history, oh, okay. but like looking at games as a cultural form. Mm -hmm. uh, not 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 you know uh, appro approaching games first and foremost as a cultural form, as opposed to say as a technical. Is that is it something that oh they're a, they're a type of software. I'm saying no. We're approaching games. No, they're a they're a they're a type of culture, and um, and our focus is very much on the on the creative practice. And game design is creative practice, not on on necessarily a literary critical or or art historical point of view. Although that's part of what we're doing, but um, but grounded in the humanities in that sense, not in the sense that it's that it's a, but that it is a, a creative form, right? Uh, um, it like why why are we why why is that our approach? Is it just is it just because that feels natural to us? Is it because we feel like that's a, an important kind of un, under? Is that is that is that an emerging consensus that 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 games are uh, primarily a form of culture and should be thought about that way, or is that just is but, it just is it beyond question, or is it our particular approach? But but do you think it does tie into to I know also what what we've been discussing a, a few times, right? This sort of question that that that. that that it, th this is something that people find meaningful, right? And this is something that people have sort of, sort of emotional experiences toward. And this is something that, sort of, that, that changes over time and interacts with other parts of culture. And, 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 and just looking at, just looking at, 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 you can't answer those kind of things. You can't understand that, like, from a purely technical perspective. And it just sort of means that, that I mean, so, so, I think. I mean, I think this was game development, GDC, game development, GDC uh, Europe in two thousand and two. There, there was I forget which which developer asked the, the kind of this kind of audience of two hundred developers. This this is two thousand and two, and asked them, all right, so how many of you have changed your game designs in relation to September eleven? And like, no one raised their hand. Everybody was like just completely shocked. And then he just he said. He said, "Like, look, you will, you need to think about what your audience is, who, what they're thinking about, what's meaningful to them at this given point in time. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing that, you're doing something wrong." And so, so this is like a strong example, obviously. But I think, I think that that's that that is what this kind of we can call like humanities or arts approach sort of brings is to think more about like what is already meaningful to people and how do games actually sort of fit into their their lives and to yeah. what they consider important. You can see that in the students. Like, I used to teach a game character design class, and I'd have students analyze their favorite character. And the kind of passionate writing and the sort of 
detail and description. Like I just realized like all of these undergrads I was meeting had had these transformative, deeply impressionable experiences with games, yeah. and they weren't getting to talk about that anywhere as grown-ups, mm. you know, that yeah. all of the literature and writing about it was in this, you know, walkthrough kind of genre, which was really peculiar. Yeah, so yeah. to me, it seems really natural that you would take this stance because yeah. now there's a whole, it's so deeply meaningful to so many mm -hmm. people, like, here, you know, those are their experience, those are the transformative but I, but I also think that universities have. evolve very slowly. So I see the MFA program as part of what I would call a second wave of game-related departments and programs at universities. The first wave being from the last 10 or 20 years, basically games, people interested in games squatting in other departments, almost universally. Now, there are a few exceptions. I think DigiPen and Pulsale have been around for a while. But most of the, uh, most of the really reputable programs are inside other things. So... The, the Henry Jenkins Media Studies mm -hmm. program at MIT, I mean, game studying games within media studies mm -hmm. at USC where they're making all these great games. It's still in an, I think, interactive media, interactive cinema within program. So so, so um, the work that Ken Perlin does here for many years in computer graphics, games, games related stuff, it's in a computer, traditional computer science program. So, mm -hmm. so, so we're just, I mean, there aren't actually that many programs that are Really, that that have the name game in the degree that you get from the not not like well I got a media studies with a focus on games so and so or my, this was my dissertation or thesis project but even even at um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon the the you know where where um, uh, Jesse Shell teaches the that's ATC. entertainment technology yeah. they couldn't put the word game in there because really until the the phenomena that Jesper charts in his book A Casual Revolution which was in the last four or five years. Games were just seen as this kind of throwaway kiddie stuff. And there's this way that games have, gamers have grown up, first of all, and that games have become more approachable and kind of permeated our culture. So that's also part of it, is that it feels, it feels so right to us and so obvious that, well, there's no problem with having games alongside film and television and theater and music and other yeah. art forms. But in a funny way, it's just like that bit is just flipping within the kind of university yeah. consciousness. So I think our timing is yeah, has sure. been spot and on. I actually think of this as as one of the thing the one of the ways that we contribute mm -hmm. to the world mm -hmm. is is part of, is being part of this ongoing conversation and saying, no, games are an important thing unto themselves that are worthy of study. They have a status that that means that they belong in the university. Um, and not just as a as a subject of of analytical study, but actually uh, to to understand how to make them better, right? What you know, to, to, that, a, that a life spent playing games, thinking about games, talking about games, making games that is a life well spent. And you, you there's no reason to be ashamed of it. There's no reason to have to frame it as um, as as a as a part of something that is 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 justified for some other reason. Yeah. Oh, because I'm 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 growing muscles, or because I'm getting smart at math, or because <laughs> you know I'm learning about immunology or, or something like that, um, or that I'm I'm curing cancer, or you know, no, just for its own sake. And I think we're part of that conversation. We say yeah. yes, that there's enough people that that feel this way, that this is a consensus, and and now now it's time to to move forward. Yeah, but but then I also think that that said like. That, that I think it's important to say that what what's important to us is also like the the, the, the craft involved, right? That it's not just that we're we're sitting around smoking pipes. You know, you're probably not even allowed to smoke a pipe at a university. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll find out. Yeah. and then, yeah, and, then <laughs> and saying like how meaningful games are, but also that we sort of care about it on, on a game design level and and and, and, to, and, and to like to like like programming programming shaders or or, yes. or what have you. That that it's like. Yeah, that that meaning just doesn't emerge sort of like out of nothing, but it's like fr from craft, from development, from and all of these things that don't need to to go together. Mm -hmm. So so how does this this consensus that that we have approaching uh, games within the arts and uh, and and the humanities and how does that affect this question of research that that mm -hmm. came up? In I, I'm going to play devil's advocate here and say that um, I'm. I tend to be more skeptical than 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 most about the value of most of the research that 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 I see uh, getting done within within games, you know, the sort of scholarly field. Um, I see a lot of what strikes me um, uh, as being kind of like pseudoscience, right? Because I don't I don't know um, exactly what feeds into it, but I see a lot of stuff where. 
people are studying the spread of disease in World of Warcraft and then writing a paper that, you know, or, uh, you know, or stuff like that equation you put up as a joke um, where I feel like a, there's a lot of research that almost kind of like tends to be like that. Where let's let's count the number of interactions in this um, uh, in this platformer and say, okay, can we find an optimal uh, number or what can we learn about that? And to me, there's some, there's something that reminds me of there's a there's a problem uh, called the the Napoleon Dynamite problem, right? So um, Netflix has this problem in their in their recommendation engine. They have these algorithms for recommending movies and. Um, and there's a, this little knot at the center of the whole network, which is Napoleon Dynamite, right? It's a movie that kind of everyone likes, and, and liking it doesn't, um, doesn't really uh, shunt you off in, in a different direction into the, into the taste space, right? And so they actually, they, they, they put out a, a big chunk of money to, like, to people doing research to, like, solve this problem. My, and that kind of reminds me of, of a lot of what I see in, in, in the kind of is research that happens. Is it a technical problem for the rating right. system, or is it just a problem of understanding? Right, because in, in, my, in my view... How is it a problem? In my view... Uh, for, for Netflix, it's a prediction problem. It's a prediction okay. problem for Netflix. But in, in my view, the, the problem is m movies are, are machines that are designed to outwit the algorithms that we might want to use to recommend them to each other, right? Every it's like that that um, that the, the the slide you put up about uh, the, the 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 disco suit in mm -hmm. Saturday Night Fever, right? That there is there is a thing in which artwork or or cultural works always are going to exceed our ability to sort of take them apart analytically and explain mm -hmm. uh, uh, how they work, and yet there seems to be a lot of desire. To, 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 to do that. So what well, do you guys think, you know, So one thing I was going to say is it, it's funny that you use Netflix as an example and that they put out a chunk of money for a research question. Right. One huge issue is patronage, at least in, like, the computer science and social science area, which is that game companies spend no money on research. They don't direct the questions. They bitch about what comes out of academia, but they don't actually front any money for it, whereas, like, Yahoo, Microsoft... Netflix, those people are trained to seed funds and have interns and create a flow of people asking the right questions. So I think part of it is that people who exist in the academic world, they're trying to answer questions that will advance them in their strange right. game. Yeah. And so there's not enough influence happening from the game And, and as a result, you're getting environment. these weirdly pseudo-objective views. To me, there's a lot of stuff where it's like there, no amount of counting sharps and flats is going to tell you the difference between Miles Davis and Chuck Mangione. No, but it's and yet there's more so a many white papers that are the equivalent yeah. Yeah. Of, of counting notes in, in, a, in yeah. a jazz composition. You know what I mean? No, am, no, am, no. am I wrong about that? Or, or? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's complicated. No, but I mean, uh, okay, so, so I think there's several things going on. Like, what, one is that, that, that one is that, that uh, the games have had a kind of cool factor, which meant that, that it's been this kind of placeholder that people have been projecting all kinds of stuff onto, mm -hmm. like including mm -hmm. all kinds of disciplines. So, so, and of course, and then you might say as a researcher, one of your, one of your, one of the kind of your constituencies is always like the research field you're coming from, right? And then, 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 I mean, some research papers just don't make any sense if you're not from a specific research field, because it's like, Research, research this, uh, field might have like a specific theory and say like for all culture it is the case that blah blah blah, and then, then, then you read a paper that states something completely obvious about uh, something you feel is obvious about games, and then there's something about like this technique. This means that yada yada, some research, some somebody you never heard about, right? And then, but that that's the paper. That that is like the the last bit that you're not reading because it doesn't make any sense to you. It's the one that's important to the research. And I think that's the problem. Well, I so, can so, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And the other thing, I, I think that's also... So, what, what I actually worry more about pseudo-subjectivism. Oh! So, so, I like that so, 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 No, no, so I feel... No, I, I just feel that, that, that many people are afraid of saying... Well, actually saying, saying like, what a game is or how games work or, mm. or, or what, what's good and what's bad or how... Because, because, because there's a kind of tendency that you should be sort of like super sensitive to like context and, and the individual player and so on, mm. to the extent that you're sort of afraid of actually saying anything. And I think I made that case before that in, in a way it's perhaps even better to, to sort of sometimes, sometimes, sometimes to try to overgeneralize it or to be too strong. Because that it is even helpful for students, right, to, to make claims that can be falsified, falsified and to make, 
to just like to, to talk about talk about aesthetics in a way that the aesthetics of games in a way that students can sort of think about. All right, this is the convention, but could hmm. we actually sort of twist it around? So I think uh, actually sort of trying to define games and try to narrow down 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 things is actually something that sort of generates creativity. Hmm. I says, yeah, I was going to say speaking to that, like when I did my character design book, most of what I was doing was translating results from social psych that no game designer was ever going to pour through the journals to figure out to what they're really doing when they craft characters mm -hmm. across the division lines of artist, program, or whatever, so that somebody could just get all that stuff in a nutshell. And I think that's another issue is mm. there aren't people sitting in the middle and connecting the dots and say, okay, this is the insider conversation that's still going on. This is the stuff in the basic textbook that you can pretty much rely on about how human beings work that you're actually using anyway, so why don't you understand what it is you're doing? So you can so you can you can say that that games are best understood uh, as you know within the arts and still you can still make broad empirical claims yeah. within the realm of aesthetics. That's kind of what you're saying, and it can still be useful to to do that methodology. And I guess I, in a way, I, I Hoffman just, is it Hoffman is the guy that you studied under the the the, the color theorist. I'm sorry, Albers, Joseph Albers. Joseph Albers. His students. His students. His, I and, and I guess that in a weird way is kind of like that. Like he was doing. It is. Like he was it's kind of like making similar. broad empirical. Uh, formal claims I know, about but how I, it works. I had this moment of vertigo when you were talking. I realized we're Joseph Albers. Right. We're, we're, the, we're like the out of date, like old right. fashioned, too rigid professors that students are going to come we're in training and new ha people have to, to have take to our place. Have to yeah. rebel against because we're kind <laughs> of out of job. tune with what's actually going on within culture. And then, so we're part of this kind of you know, ebb and flow of the tides of culture and as uh, being part of weird universities. Of, I refuse um, to do that. I, yeah. I want to be ahead. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, yeah. feels, it feels weird. Like I said, I hadn't thought about it that way. But I mean, I, I have reached a point where Rules of Play came out 10 years ago. So I'm realizing it's no longer interesting new ideas. It's the established ideas that everyone has are to write a paper. Are you into your windmill? Are you, willing, are you willing to say right now that Rules of Play is completely wrong? Everything in Rules of Play is wrong. Um, yeah, You're but every, everything, every book is completely wrong from one point of view or another. So, um, <laughs> so I, sure. I, um, all right. So, so one one of the things I want to talk about. Let's last topic, and then let's throw it open to the to the crowd. Um, which is are they lions or lambs? Which is um, <laughs> this is the lion. Segment. One of the things that that that's important for us. Okay, so games are so hard to teach uh, as creative practice uh, because. They're just hard to make. It's like the hardest thing in the world to do because it's all of the problems yes. of building a 747 and all of the problems of writing a poem, yeah. right? It's like all the problems of building a bridge and all the problems of putting on an opera. And, and you have to do that at the same time. And you do that in, in, in often in collaborative groups where you have a mix of dis different disciplines that all come together as, as game development. And, and I think that's a challenge that we are going to face, uh, in, especially in, in, the, in the graduate program. And um, so how do you do that? How do you go about building a, a thriving, uh, vibrant community uh, that can collaborate together and, 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 and be productive in, in that process? I mean, I, 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 I don't think games are that unique. I think you can look at other phenomena like creating a feature film, creating a large building, designing a large public park, that all combine aspects of poetics with a tremendous amount of technical knowledge and a tremendous sort of logistics of logistics of production, design and production, and over long periods of time. So I, I, I don't think they're that. But most that, of those that, fields, it's, the technologies are stabilized. Like I think one thing that's yeah. weird about games is it's like the technology itself is wiggling like jello and it's always evolving, mm -hmm. which means you don't like with film. Film is pretty conservative about the tech, with the exception of the CG stuff that's happened. But right. you know, like the actual. No, it's true. I recently and... was involved in some filmmaking, and it's the the degree to which the budgets are detailed for each each day of shooting is unbelievable. It blows away games in terms of the degree of specificity by which you can know exactly how much money you're going to spend on a given day, exactly what personnel, exactly what you're going to do. Of course, there's there's you know. Uh, uh, overages built into budgets, but the, with games, it's like we, we're not we're in we're in the design phase. We don't know exactly what the alpha is going to look like, but we have you know we're doing iterative design and scrum methodology and all of these other things. So it's there's there's a lot of uncertainties, but it's just um, yeah. But the, I don't know. That's just part of the creative challenge. I mean, I think the funny thing is that the industry is going to roll forward regardless, right? I mean, that's the that's the funny thing about having a program like this is that 
games are going to be made whether or not we educate people to be more interesting or better designers or more critical scholars and thinkers about them or not. So I, actually that's kind of weirdly comforting to me. So it, it, that answering the question of can it possibly be done? Can no, no, the question is how do you build uh, this, this kind of collaborative community? How do you, how do you weave well, together oh, the threads of these different you. disciplines that are required? Well, you know, one of the great things about games today as opposed to 10 years ago is that, is that when you and I first started making games together almost 20 years ago, it was sort of all Hollywood and no independent cinema. The only games that were made were large-scale retail games. So this was in the 90s when there were no longer one or two person console teams making things for, you know, like Atari and television from 15 years earlier, but, but there weren't yet really small scale online games or casual games or independent games. In the last handful of years, suddenly this idea that, that, that you could make a small scale game and it's a kind of a valid cultural work is interesting and that you can have people working by themselves or, or, or on a solo team or or have a kind of a fluid community of independent designers. And, 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 and I actually think that our, our community is probably going to be based sort of on the, our experience in the New York indie game scene. A and even, bit. even though more weirdly, sometimes people actually make money off those one person right. teams. Right. Yeah. yeah so, so it's individual, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, for the creators, it's generally much more lucrative if it's successful than you know, being the creative director of a big franchise, you know, mm -hmm. where your studio goes under mm -hmm. six months later because it didn't do well. Yeah. So, so to me, it's, it, it, it is about, about, about a, like helping students sort of, break, sort of do all, all of the scales, like think about, thinking about like the nose, the butts and, and the nuts and bolts of, of like the kind of very small design detail and being able to sort of think about it. I didn't like to say that. I didn't like to say that. It was, hang, it was hanging in the air. I, I'm not from here. So. All right, so... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, all right, so, so it's about allowing people to sort of scale, like, from that kind of small detail to being able to think about the big picture. So I think that's really important, like, to, to say that th both of those things are, are valid and both of those things are, are necessary. But it's all, then it's also about, about making sure that the, the game that we, we make is, is, is correctly set up, right, that it's not that we are saying, like, this is what a good game is, right? We might have an idea, but, but more that, that in a way like we're teaching more like methods for thinking about things mm -hmm. that, that's sort of sufficiently open. So, so I like this kind of idea that sometimes that, that students can, can, can make games that are wildly experimental and may or may not be successful, but that the important thing really is that, that say like having a good method for, 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 go, for, for exploring the design space or having, uh, having, being able to articulate why you're going where you're going and then Sort of like sort of just giving yourself, so anyway, like us giving the freedom to not just sort of like look for what we were or looking for already, but to allow that kind of give the kind of space for it. Right. Can I, I could say sure. that in a slightly different way? A bad game is a predictable game, so that if you if you if you watching a sport and one team is trouncing the other and you're not going to watch the second half of the game because there's no way one's going to win. So we love games whether through story or through gameplay or social interaction that surprise us, right? And the design process is similar. That we, we don't know exactly the game we're going to make when we set out to make it. And that's kind of part of the magic of, of any design process. But I think it, it's especially true of games. So for this program, we're setting up structures and, and ideas and the, the so-called rules of the game. But the way that they play out are unexpected. That, and, and we hope that they're unexpected. And, and we can't predict them. And we don't want to fully predict them. And how the, how the program will evolve and what the students will do and what they'll produce is is uh, I think it's it's really up in the air, and I don't think we would we would want to be able to know that how we're gonna what the impact is, even what the measure of success is. So I think that that's that's kind of the balance is that we want to we you know we we want to strongly know what what the methodologies and and uh, and ideas are going into the curriculum, but ultimately I think we want to be surprised by what comes out of it. Nice. Um, so why don't we open it up to to Q and A with the with the the audience out there? Does anyone? Um, have any questions uh, or comments for the panel? Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, as far as, you know, games in academia and sort of trying to uh, take gaming on a whole, and, you know, I apply this across the board, video, uh, you know, standard board games, card games, whatever have you, um, is it something that really lends itself to being course material, or is it something that has only had its success up until this point because of the various backgrounds of the people becoming involved? Um, I say that because any given game, uh, large scale or small, you know, one person can, can make a video game, put it up online and be successful, but you can also have your AAA titles where you have artists, you have musicians, you have marketers, you have business people who hold it all together. 
uh, chances are most of those people did not start going, I'm going to get into the game industry. They were looking for a career or they knew sort of what they like doing, but they didn't necessarily know where they wanted to go with it. Um, and if, if you sort of take all of that and turn it into effectively a major, does not, not take away some of, of the magic of these people coming together and bringing diverse skill sets to the process of developing the game. You guys have a... Well, I think part of it is, I mean, the, it's a grad program that is being run, and I think that it's really different to come to a grad program with your own mature set of skills in a particular discipline and know that you want to engage in the practice of game design you know, you're still bringing your strengths, so it, it's a little different than an undergrad major in that sense because you're already formed, at least in the U.S. educational system, you had a major before and it probably wasn't games. So, and maybe you worked for a while and you got an angle and kind of a perspective on what you think you want to make, and I, I imagine those are a lot of the people that we're mm -hmm. going to see in this program. So that's, that's I, part of I it. I think it's a super valid question, and I often worry about the fact that mm -hmm. we're going to create a bunch of students who their entire time at NYU almost will be taken up with, with game related courses. And is, is that really what we want? To churn out students that are sort of myopically blinded you know, by only thinking about games? I think it's a problem in games now that, as Jesper's example of September 11th showed, that games are often made by and for gamers who have other games as their main cultural references, right? So, so will our students be, be able to take art history courses, music courses, um, philosophy courses, things that have nothing to do with games, because that's that's what game the game industry needs as much as it needs good anthropologists and good you know good good uh, crafts people that are doing design and things like that. So I, I think yeah. it's a really really. I mean, it question. also seems to me like a, a, the, it's a really interesting uh, question and a, and a serious problem. But it's also true of of any field. Any field, like it's true of literature, right? It's true of, of painting. It's true of theater. It's true of, of filmmaking. Um, so I think we have to we have to answer that question like uh, like like those other fields do. How how do you make a? I think that you can look at programs in these other things and say, oh no, that that there is a way of doing it that that provides a real value to people. Um, and for some people, it's the perfect context for unlocking the greatest you know potential that they have. And as long as that 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 answer is yes, then I think it, it makes it worthwhile. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yes, in the back. I was just going to say that um, I feel like seeing this panel, it's really exciting because um, I think coming out of the art world into games and game design and games for education, um, I see a tension between, you know, the technical side, the philosophy behind games, and, you know, the craft of game design, and I feel like wherever you pitch yourself, it's going to be awkward to interface with those other parties, other stakeholders, you know? Like, I see people coming out of other schools of NYU that are, you know, on the social science side of things, and when I read what their sort of literature is around gaming as, like, clearly non-gamers, you know, the games that they reference, or, like, you know, maybe their, their buy-in, it seems very low. Their, the nuance that they bring to what they're sort of saying about games doesn't match at all what, you know, I sort of would expect from people to be bringing to games. So it's really nice to kind of see all these things sort of holistically represented in all of your fields. Um, I kind of had a question for Catherine, which was that um, I'm wondering, um, as somebody who is in, you know, in a science institution, um, and just in general coming, you know, into studying things sort of empirically, like what, um, what the challenges are in the community there of trying to sort of work with something that is a creative discipline and a design discipline, and then analyze it through. Well, uh, so Catherine, I just realized yeah. we're being recorded, so maybe we want to. Yeah. Repeat the, the question. Repeat the oh, question. I'm sorry. Justin, oh my gosh. Want a mic? Like how do you how do you how do you make people who are more coming from a social science or empirical or technical background more comfortable with thinking about something like games as an aesthetic object? Well, I mean, interestingly enough, like in my field, which is human computer interaction, because now we have smartphones and because eighty million people are playing a particular, you know, Facebook game and because there are movement based controllers in the living room, all of a sudden all the techies are just fine with trying to figure out what is an emotional experience for everyday consumers. So it's actually a nice moment from the tech point of view. They don't necessarily want to call it game, but if you frame it as emotion and emotional and social response to technology, they're really kind of talking about the same thing, just with more awkward terminology. So that's, that's, that's the bridge I'm standing on that allows me to bring that material back to them. But yeah, a lot of times it, it does make them a little nervous um, 
Also, it, it has people self-select for different fields, and you get these odd cultures within fields, and so you know sometimes that's just a, a strange cycle that has to shift, right? But I, I I do think that you make a great observation that I could be wrong about this <laughs> because my you know my sample size or the other sort of uh, are kind of brainy game designers that sort of think too much about what they do. Um, but I do think that if you look at filmmaking, there's this huge schism between cinema studies and filmmaking in, in the academy and outside the academy. Um, and there's not that much interaction, as far as I know, with filmmakers kind of theorizing about what they do as, a, as an active part of a practice. Um, I think that it's more common in games. Maybe it's because the technology is changing and we're all trying to figure out what we're doing as we're doing it, it's like, you know, building the plane while it's yeah, flying. Yeah, because I, kind of I bet, you know, like your more indie film auteurs, you know, like engage Peter Greenaway, that stuff just, more closely. Yeah, we just saw this recent uh, talk he gave about yeah. the end of cinema and this great theater. No, no, they, they're versus, willing to engage it, yeah. but if you're in an established genre, and I think you find that's true of game developers sometimes, too. The ones that are really entrenched in a genre sometimes are the least interested in talking about the meta aspects of the form, but people who've worked across different genres and different platforms are much more willing to, to go there. So that's part of it, too. Um, any other questions? Yes. Um, I guess sort of building on, on that point about the schism um, between the, the sort of the two sides, and, and Catherine, I guess you, you sort of briefly touched on this, but can you talk a little bit about your relationship with sort of the industry at large? And, and yeah. you said, is there is there sort of an appetite for an understanding of this? Oh, totally. Well, so I remember like the first time I went to GDC, I was a student volunteer like in the early 90s, and I remember sitting at a table with like Noah Falstein and some of these other like, you know, gray beard dudes of, of the game conference who was in Santa Clara, okay? And I mean, that for them, like the thing they hate the most is someone who pontificates that doesn't listen to their really in interesting and engaged discourse about what they're doing. And I think unfortunately, like Esper was saying, because games became trendy, they got exposed to a lot of rather sort of flabby and stupid discourse from academia that well, well, it wasn't like, even that good to begin with. Like, so like somebody like Will Wright, he can see right through some of these silly ideas and he doesn't want to take them up even though he's very theoretical. But I think there's a huge thirst for that kind of knowledge among designers in the industry. They just have become frustrated over time in trying to figure out where to go to talk about these things with the right sorts of academics. And then, and they're busy, they don't have a lot of time, so then they get annoyed a couple times and they're kind of done with it, you know? But, but you might say there also is a, there's, there's also a job for for us sort of like explaining what what's relevant what may or may not be relevant yes. for, for, for 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 a developer I mean, it's like it just is the case that a lot of good research may not be directly applicable right? no, that's true and then yeah. also that 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 research may not be able to answer exactly the question that a developer wants answered right so so there is always this kind of danger of of that kind of perfect formula, right? Mm -hmm. That 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 in a way, especially like say if you if you're if you're in a in a high level position in in a in a in a, in a game in a, in a game publisher, and you have this like we have a twenty 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 million dollar budget, like because what you want, like the answer you want, the question you want answered is the one like how do we make that perfect game that makes all of the money back? But that may not be an answer that that actually sort of exists in the kind of form that people want. And so, so it also like that's a job for us, like explaining what kind of things that we can actually answer. And I, I will go even farther and say it frustrates me when I see developers demanding of academics, mm. how do you, how does, how does this help me make a better game? It's not the purpose of sociology of, of sociologists who happen to be studying games to help people make better games. It's the purpose of sociology, in my understanding, to understand society mm -hmm. um, and, and social relations in any number of ways that sociology does it through economic sociology or cultural sociology. Mm -hmm. So it, that their, their, their research sometimes is research for a home discipline that has nothing to do with, yeah. with development or business. So I just, I actually get really yeah. frustrated yeah. by that and, and I don't think that academics should be, um, that's like me going to a symphony orchestra concert and saying, how does this help me make a better game? But I wouldn't if I either, you know, <laughs> I can't put this soundtrack into my game. Rito. Yeah, no, I get, I get uh, inspired maybe on a, in terms of aesthetics or structural level, or I look at the way that the audience applauds or doesn't applaud in between the movements, and I say, God, that's interesting. Could I set up a situation where players don't know if they should be thankful or, or nervous about what's coming next? So in any thousand ways, but it's up to me to bridge that gap between my creative work as a designer and some other cultural thing or other 
academic paper that I read. So I, that actually gets me kind of steamed up. Yeah. I think that, that that's, I think it's kind of idiotic for, for developers to think that universities were invented to help them make better games. I think that that's, that's um, I think that's idiotic. But I think it would be great Honestly. for the, the, the developers that actually do reflect. And I'm not saying that, that you have that position at all. I'm just it's making me think about. So then the, do, you, do you see a greater disconnect between sort of the industry and, and what you guys are doing? Um, no, I actually think, like I said, when I look at other cultural fields or my limited knowledge of them, I actually think that for whatever reason, the game industry is is sort of nerdier and, and more interested in research and, and a little bit more interested in, a little more open to the integration of um, uh, uh, of research, especially the designers, maybe the business mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. less so. But I actually think it's, I actually think it's, it's at a point where there's a lot of hyper practitioners. I also think that the rise of independent games and people that don't have to go work in a big company for three years in order to make a game and are not allowed to speak in public because they're working at a big company, they've signed a release, and are not allowed to publish papers. Now that you have indie, indie developers that are also maybe getting a graduate degree or they have a blog or they also do journalism, you have all these wonderful kind of mixing going on, and I, I think it's great. And I also think that, I mean, for what we're doing, um, I think there's less of a disconnect because mm. Because our MFA is much more about design, creative focused. practice. Game yeah. design is creative practice. It's yeah. more like an arts uh, school approach or a, or a film school approach, where it's 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 the people you know figuring out how to unlock the greatest potential of their own creative practice and and then doing it and making great stuff and then going into the industry and 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 and, and having a huge impact however they want to by 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 you know getting a, a job at, at Blizzard or Valve or or by starting their own company or by doing independent work as an individual. Um, so there's less of a sense of us, oh, we're not tinkering away to do, re you know, there will be some research and scholarly work, but it's more within the context of hands-on practice. So it's like, um, the, the, I think that we're going to be closer to, to um, doing the kind of, having a relationship to the industry where it's like narbacular drop comes out. And then, you know, they, they, they there are students that, that did this amazing, uh, there's a, a, a team of students that, that did this amazing work. Um, this this game uh, never actually dropped. That went went on to become Portal, mm -hmm. right? Um, they were that was kind of an experimental kind of a, a, a work that was done in a university context, um, and then they got acquired by Valve, and and that became the the kernel that 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 that, that produced Portal. So that's another kind of relationship that's um that's that's different, and and I think we're going to be close to that. Yeah. Do you see that as problematic at all, or at least something that you have to put sort of extra thought into that like the cultural artifacts produced by the practice of game design are currently uh, somewhat valuable in like the, the marketplace that you have potentially, like uh, in film schools, like what students don't own their work, uh, or at some graduate schools like Media Lab. Or At Tisch, the students do own their work. Yeah. So here, the, the, yeah. Do we own the actual property of their work? Well, and then that, that being established, like, do you see it as your role to train people in the kind of like uh, meta Game of being a practicing game designer who's trying to support themselves that way, or do you, you have you have to acknowledge that. Yeah. I mean, you can you you that's the part of mentoring students well, whether it's formalized in the class or not. I mean, you have to help them understand what the work contexts are and w what things to look out for. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that that's that's probably a secondary. I think that'll be part of of, yeah. of the of the the process that that we're trying to uh, that we're trying to educate our, our students in. But I think it's a secondary part because the you don't have that problem unless the work is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're gonna try to like get people to make the best work that they can, um, to become like you know brilliant game developers and that that are capable of producing work that then Blizzard and Valve are fighting over, you know, and then and then worry about how to defend, how to teach them how to defend themselves. But 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 it, but it is something we 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 so we I mean so we haven't run the program yet. Students in the minor already asked those questions. Yeah, but, but we, we have undergrads that are dealing but, but with this issue. They're yeah. hungry for for this. I mean, we've been we've been, we've been thinking about say like having like perhaps like a lawyer stop by mm -hmm. or something to to sort of give advice right. and that kind of stuff. So so I think it, it, but it, clear, it, it, clearly, clearly, if you listen to what how Frank described the program, we're not the kind of program that literally prepares you to be a cog in a corporate machine where you are learning very specific software skills so that you can work at Pixar as an animator or you can work at, at a big EA studio in, you know, in a long production pipeline. We're, we're, probably, we're not that kind of program. And in that sense, we're de-emphasizing the vocational part of what we're doing. What's interesting is that because of the rise of indie games, yeah, it's possible to, to self-publish. 
look, does, being a designer as opposed to an artist, there is a difference there. And I think being yeah. a designer means that you are, like I said, part of that humanistic thing about imagining the context is all the aspects of that context, which include, is it for a gallery and in a sort of art world context? Is it for a, is it for a commercial context? And, you, you know, what, there's this, a, a nice statement that's been made recently, I forget who said it, but, but in all of these sort of online games, iOS, virtual world, uh, a virtual item stuff, um, demo for free, the game design and the business model are totally intertwined. So it's part of the same problem. In other words, are you imagining that someone gets this for free and then they start paying for virtual items? Well, that affects the kind of psychological shape of the economy that you're going to design as a meaningful experience for someone. And so all of these things are intertwined. I mean, I don't think that we, I don't, I, I, I don't think that we're trying to. I don't think that's the focus of our program, as Frank said. But I think but, it's part of being a designer. But it's, but it's. Luckily, there's precedent for this, right? So the foundation is the students own the IP of the work, that, the original work that they're creating. And then we can look at what, what has happened, like what are, what are the cases in the world where this has happened. There's lots of examples of, of work coming out of contexts like this. Um, uh, Genova Chen and, and Kelly Santiago going on to start that game company and producing Flow and Flower. Um, uh, world of Goo, the, the you know, 2D boy, and those guys coming out of, uh, I think, Carnegie Mellon. And, and, uh, and more recently, Dear Esther, you know, coming out of uh, Dan Pitchbeck's, uh, you know, kind of research and, and within an academic context and, and then becoming a, a commercial product and, and, or something like Joust, which is uh, Doug Wilson's, uh, you know, uh, part of his, like, you know, research as, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, um, a student and, and uh, as a PhD student. Um, and so I think we, we can draw from, from, you know, the, the precedents and then and try to, try to, um, use that to get smart about this question. I, I, I do think it's important. Yeah. Um, this, I guess, from a more techno pr technical perspective, um, it seems like within the industry there are like just many different game engines being developed with new technology just around the corner. Every game engine seems to have a specific focus on what genre they make. Um, as a student in like the game design minor, we're working specifically with Unity 3D. How will the technical skills that I gain using Unity uh, translate into like a real job where you know it could be a, the Unreal Engine or something even new? Great question. Yeah, I mean, I think when you're choosing a game engine for academic use, you have to balance a lot of factors. I mean, I've actually run a similar class in an Unreal Engine, and it can be very unfriendly to students who aren't technical to get going on design, and they can spend a lot of time lost in minutia. So if you're a technical student, you might benefit a lot from working in something like Unreal. The thing about Unity and the reason why you, we use it, we, well, I picked it for a couple of reasons. One is, it started on the Mac, so it has one of the most accessible interfaces for like a wide range of trained people, like arts trained or technology trained. But also, it, it has grown so much that you can release things in a, in a wide variety of forms. Like you can release something on an iPhone, you can release something in a browser, even though it's a 3D engine. I mean, I think there's no one perfect engine, and we've had a lot of conversation yeah. about... It's just, something we've been talking right, about a lot yeah. recently. Just, just yeah. so you know, the structure of the master's program, the backbone every semester is that you're taking a, a, a studio one and two your first year, a thesis mm -hmm. one and two your second year. Studio one, we introduced their very first semester to uh, uh, two different game mm -hmm. engines, I think. And then after that, you're choosing the, the engine that you want to work with. It could be something that yeah. someone on your team knows really well or that you all want to try or something that you already have done, whether it's iOS or whether it's a 3D engine or something like Unity. Mm -hmm. So from then on, it's going to be student chosen. So there's going to be a lot of, we're going to, we're, like, like Catherine said, we're assuming a lot of confidence on the part of entering students. Mm -hmm. um, now, not everyone is a programmer, right? There's, you can come in with a focus on visual design, game design, criticism, or game programming. So not the minority of our students will be focused on, on programming as but, well. But actually, we had the discussion about, like, in a way that would be something sort of very sort of smooth about just like having the one engine for the mm -hmm. entire program. Mm -hmm. But actually, we, we discussed that and, and, and realized that it was a better idea to make sure that all students are exposed to several engines, just like understanding what mm -hmm. you're saying, like that, that every engine, in a way, has a kind of preference for the kind of game being made. Engines are designed. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. I mean, you you yeah, said it. Like they, they really, yeah. um, they they have so many uh, preconceptions built into them about the type of game you're you're building. So it's very important for us to be thoroughly agnostic. Mm -hmm. And um, and quite honestly, I think as as someone who you know who hires who is a working uh, game developer, runs my own studio and, and hires people. Um, I think I'm less interested in students or, or in someone coming out of a program that has a 
a, a deep knowledge of one particular technology and much more interested in them being able to show strong work, you know, that, 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 that they, they, they've collaborated with other people or worked on their own to create a finished game that looks interesting and good and is, you know, and is done and is playable, um, regardless of what the engine is on. Um, because the way the, the, the industry is moving, uh, even practicing game developers are learning new engines every, you know, every so often, uh, just constantly on a rolling basis. So, mm -hmm. um, other, any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, I, uh, I teach a class uh, really, really basic for high school students, um, intro to game design and intro to game studies. Um, and I'm really curious what you guys have to say about um, a high school population or a middle school population, um, especially thinking of the next you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 years um, coming out. Like, what, are your, what are your thoughts on a miniaturized version of this in a younger um, group of students? Well, I, I, th I think that you can look at other kinds of uh, pop cultural media or art forms and kind of see where, the, where, where they're at, right? So something like comic books, let's just take as an example, it that was not in the United States as commercially widespread as games, but still kind of important. There are a handful of departments in places where you can study comic books. There certainly are majors at art schools where you can study them. Have they gone into high schools? Well, in an art class that students might make a comic book as a project or it might be like a, a part of an English class. But it, you know, high schools, it's, high schools are highly regulated, right? Especially public high schools in terms of their curriculum. Um, on the other hand, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of remember when I was in high school in the, in the 80s, it was a little bit controversial that the jazz band had an electric bass, I remember, because it was like, <laughs> is that jazz or not jazz, and are we breaking the form? So I can I can see that, you know, it, it may seep in. Although I, I am seeing more and more, there's a lot of experiments in education going on. I, I you know, one of them is a is a product of a nonprofit I co-founded, the Institute of Play, which created that school in New York City, Quest to Learn, that's whole school based on games and play as a form of, of learning. Now that's a public school approved by the United States government, the local school, the, the, the state school board and everything. So, um, and that's, and th there's technology is very integrated into what they're doing. So there's a lot of experiments going on, um, whether that reaches kind of rank and file struggling public under, underfunded public schools. Um, uh, that's, I think that, that, that remains to be seen, but there's a huge, like, I think that if you probably go to, I mean, I have colleagues that are designing curricula for boys and girls clubs, um, um, uh, that, that are all about game design. GameStar Mechanic, that also them use GameStar Mechanic, this this, this uh, website that I mentioned before. So I think that um, you know if you look at after school programs, probably you'll find a lot of, of students that, that uh, of schools that if they have a computer lab, they want to do something creative, they're probably trying to figure out how to make games. And now that people in their 40s are gamers, grew up with games, you know, grew up playing Atari and uh, in their youth. There's there's enough of a there's some gamer in the in the in the school teacher population that that's ready to to learn enough to, to teach them how to play games in the after school program. So I I think that it's probably it's a more of a cultural thing than anything else. Uh, any other uh, any other questions? I think maybe uh, that's it, and we can wrap it up. I want to thank you very much to uh, Catherine. <laughs> Uh, all right.